So we call our presentation, um, Japan to Chicago, Architectural Connections. I'm going to begin with the influences of Japanese art and architecture on the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. And then Joan will do the second part of the program on contemporary Japanese architects and some of their work in Chicago. So Frank Lloyd Wright was born in 1867, died in 1959. So during that time, he had a very prolific career. He did 1,100 designs, 530 were built, and 430 buildings remain. So he did a variety, mostly he did residential architecture. Uh, we'll be talking mostly about his prairie homes, an example on the bottom from Iowa. He did religious buildings as the synagogue you see from Pennsylvania. And then his last commission, the Guggenheim Museum in New York. So I'm gonna be focusing on his early years in Chicago. And that was from about 1887 to 1910. And what you're seeing here is a picture of his studio, or actually you're seeing the studio, but it's attached to his home. So when he started doing his independent work in 1893, he, uh, he uh, enlarged his house and um, added his studio. So the reason I show you this is I, I kind of want you to remember throughout that when I say Frank Lloyd Wright's work or the houses of Frank Lloyd Wright, he didn't really do it all by himself. Um, the building on the left, the part of the building on the left was the drafting room or is the drafting room still there. And it's a very, you can see it's a very large space. And so at any time, Wright might've had six to eight other people working with him. Now, some of you may know about Frank Lloyd Wright's personality and you may know um, he liked to take most of the credit, but just remember he had others working with him. And we'll hear about a, a few of them uh, later. So it was here in Oak Park that Wright develops and, and comes into his own with the house that became known as the Prairie House. And the big features are it's always low lines, horizontal emphasis. The forms interlock. We, we can't see inside the house here, but open interiors. And we often talk about how he broke the box of the traditional house. And on the right, you see one of those traditional houses, the Charles Purcell house in Oak Park, which is just down the street from Wright's own home and studio. So very obviously a vertical emphasis, um, not so much interlocking, you see interior form sort of sticking out on the outside. So Wright's work was definitely a um, moving away from the traditional house. So Frank Lloyd Wright himself in his writing said that there were three things that influenced his designs. The Froebel blocks. Now we, these aren't like building blocks we might give children today, but they're wooden blocks from which you make shapes, forms, um, two or three dimensional. And so he learned a lot about geometry from them. He also credited Louis Sullivan. Louis Sullivan was actually his second employer. And he credits Sullivan with teaching him about organic ornament and using plant-like forms. And you can see an example of uh, Sullivan's organic forms. This is a column from the auditorium in downtown Chicago. It's actually up on, which you might probably know is now Roosevelt University, up in what is now their um, library. And so you can see a very uh, floral form, not exactly like you see in a traditional Greek column. 
And the third thing that Wright said influenced him were Japanese woodblock prints. And from these, he said that they were eloquent in their simplicity and the elimination of the insignificant. And I think you'll see that in, in so much of Wright's work that we're gonna look at. So Frank Lloyd Wright never said that he was influenced by Japanese architecture, but he would have been familiar with it. When he was working with Adler and Sullivan, they designed the transportation building at the 1893 World's Fair. And of course, Wright was working with them up until 1893, so he would have been down there a lot. And the transportation building was located where the arrow shows you in, in the plans. And the wooded island where the Japanese exhibit was, was quite close to it. So he had an excellent uh, opportunity to, to visit that. And when he would have gone to the wooded island, notice how it's sort of separate from the rest of the buildings in the fair. You had to go to it by a bridge. Um, you see a lot more trees than you see in the rest. And just over the top of the trees, you can see the roof lines of the Japanese building. So when Wright would visit there, he would observe, he would study, probably visited a lot, and he would notice certain things about these buildings. Uh, we don't see the, again, we don't see the interiors, but I want you to take a look at those roof lines and the eaves, because they're going to um, be evident in some of Wright's early work. So you might notice a, a similarity when you look at the Bradley House, which was completed in 1900 in Kankakee, Illinois. And I will mention um, the Bradley House that went through, you know, it was a private house. At one time it was a restaurant, but in recent years it's been restored and is now a house museum. So uh, it's one of the, the houses not too far from uh, Chicago that you can visit of rides. But notice the similarity, especially in the roof lines. Right, even closer in Oak Park, the Hills DeCaro House. This is on Forest Avenue in Oak Park. That's where the home and studio is. It's just, again, right down the street from Wright's home and studio. So you see a lot, a lot of things that you remind you of the ho ho done at the Columbian Exposition. So Wright didn't like to say that Japanese architecture influenced him. So I decided to say, well, there are parallel design features. And uh, we're gonna look at some traditional Japanese homes and then see how these ideas uh, reappear in Wright's work. So the first thing you notice as you come up to a, a Japanese house, there, there's a sense of privacy, there's a wall or there's a gated entryway. When you go inside, the interiors flow into each other. You can see from one room to the other. There's lots of wood banding. Uh, so in order to get this flow from room to room, instead of using uh, solid walls, they would use sliding doors. You get views of nature and it's very easy to make the transition from the inside to the outside. And the alcove, or what's called the tokonomo, is the focal feature of the interior. So Wright said that he wasn't influenced by Japanese architecture, but he has this quote, the Japanese house fascinated me. I would spend hours taking it apart and putting it together again. So I think uh, we can assume that he did really uh, 
take some ideas from it. So how do they appear in Rice's own work? Am I frozen? My screen, oh, there, there we go. go, okay. Um, the Hurley House uh, is one of the early prairie houses. It's 1902. It's in Oak Park, again, on that, that Forest Avenue is just a place you wanna take a walk down to see these Frank Lloyd Wright homes. I don't know why my, Uh, Try the button on your Oh, there. All right. I'm, I'll do it that way. I don't know. Um, so we see the emphasis on the horizontal, deep overhanging eaves, and indirect path to the entryway. So you can see the entryway uh, beyond the arch, but um, we can't walk right to it. It's got this pro almost like a protecting wall in front of it. So you would have to walk up on the left-hand side of the picture, go behind the prow and then enter the entryway. There's a large elevated terrace. Now you might not even notice it, but it's up here. You don't have that porch like you saw on the um, Tradi traditional house of the day. And the major living spaces are on the second floor. So these all kind of go together to, um, into two aspects that Wright talked about, prospect and refuge. You're up above, you're on the second floor, you're looking out. So, so you have a, a prospect or a good view but you might say the prying eyes down the street level can't see in, you have a, a refuge. And if you, if you think back to the, um, to the uh, traditional Japanese house, when you look at the front of the Hurtley house, it almost appears as if there's a wall in front of it. Now, when we go inside, you see that the fireplace, a very large fireplace or the hearth is the focal point of the interior. And looking at the other pictures, you can see the open plan again, where you're seeing from one room to the next. Now the Hurtley house is a private home. So you would not be able to visit the Hurtley house, unless it were on one of the house walks. And as I mentioned, it's one of the early prairies. The other house I wanna talk about also uh, in the Chicago area, but on the south side of Chicago in the Hyde Park neighborhood is the Roby House. And Roby House comes at the end of the prairie period. But again, you, you still see the same things that we're seeing in the other houses. I didn't mention on the Hurtley house, but Wright always used bands of casement windows so that when you open the window, you are completely eliminating it uh, and you get the view from the outside. I want to read you uh, just a, a short quote from the former Chicago Tribune architecture critic, Blair Kamen. He describes Roby House as magnificently sculptured, a dynamic com composition that seems to hug the earth, but fly into space. Here's another, uh, it's certainly, um, breaking the box from the traditional. So here's another view of the Roby house. 
And again, we see almost a wall-like structure in front and we could ask the question, well, how do you get in? You have that, again, sense of privacy. How do you get in? You have to walk up on the left-hand side again, tucked way back uh, away from the street. Now, Roby House is a house museum, so we can go inside and observe many of the features that we usually see in Rice Homes. The and the Roby House just went through a major restoration, oh, yeah. but here yeah, you that. see the wood banding. And notice how the light just filters in which now they're, you could call them windows, but they're actually doors that go to the outside. This is looking back from the fireplace. Uh, and actually the first picture was actually before the restoration. And this is a newer picture that was taken after the restoration. I mean, it's, they, they really did more of a color analysis and you, you see a little bit of a, a brightening. Um, two other photos. I think the photo on the left really reminds me of the picture we saw of the Japanese house with the long corridor and the uh, screens to go outside. Now, I will explain a little bit about why the picture on the left um, has those four chairs lined up there. As I say, this was after the restoration, but it wasn't quite complete because they were redesigning the seating area around the fireplace or the ingle nook. So it wasn't quite finished. So, so that's why they just lined up those chairs to, uh, to show you that, but really a, a beautiful, a beautiful house. Um, and especially after the restoration. So I think you've seen from the Japanese uh, ideas that he might have used or paralleled in his homes. And I'm going to show you one more building, which is not a house, but Unity Temple. It's one of Wright's first public buildings. It's also in Oak Park, but it's on the major uh, street of Oak Park. It's on Lake Street. And so there was an attempt. Uh, you want to have shut out the noise of the traffic. And so it's a very solid, it's very wall-like on the outside, but wait until we see the inside. Uh, I will mention that Wright did belong to the Unitarian congregation and their previous building had burned down when he was commissioned to do this. So Wright called Unity Temple his jewel box. The Japanese influence of the wood banding, the simplicity, I, I think is, is seen here. And it's interesting that the modern architect, Mies van der Rohe, I'm sure you know him from his work in Chicago, he described this interior room of Unity Temple as the source of modern architecture. And the other thing I want you to notice is this narrow passageway here. That's how you enter Unity Temple. You enter through this very narrow space. Um, sometimes you hear the terms compression and release. You go through this narrow space and then you come into this beautiful space. So you have an, another view looking directly to the front. And you also have a view of the skylight, which lets in the, the light from above with its geometric pattern again. But now you don't exit the same way you came in. You go forward, everyone goes forward, a very different um, than a usual way a congregation leaves. And those doors open and you exit in twos and threes into the uh, fellowship space. So Wright also said this was a room complete in itself. So the last two um, 
the last two buildings I've shown you, Roby House and Unity Temple, are two of the eight buildings of rights that have been designated as World Heritage Sites. And that just happened in 2019. So I'm just gonna say a little bit about Japanese art and how um, it was the architect's other passion, so to speak. Wright collected, sold architecture prints. He was a dealer in Japanese prints. He often used them as collateral for loans uh, or to pay his debts. He went to Japan for the first time in 2005 he exhibited at the Art Institute in 1906, and he wrote a pamphlet. And at his death, he had a huge collection of prints, stencils, and textiles. Um, we have, there are some works in the Art Institute that at one time were owned by Frank Lloyd Wright, but he didn't donate them. He has sold to a man that you might have heard of, uh, Clarence Buckingham. You, I'm sure, all know that the fountain was named after him. And Clarence Buckingham left his collection of Japanese work to the Art Institute. The Woodblock Black Prince also influenced the drawings that Wright and his associates did. And this one is by Marion Mahoney or Marion Mahoney Griffin. And she really will change the way that presentation drawings were done. And you can see the influence of the Japanese bringing the uh, outside close, framing the, the, um, the buildings with plants. Uh, you might know that she married another associate of rights, Walter Burley Griffin, and they moved to Australia when he got the competition, or he won the competition to design Canberra. Now, the reason I also brought her up is because, you know, I don't know how, how many of you are from Evanston, but you're associated with Evanston. And... Um, just south in the neighborhood of Rogers Park, you have a park named for Marion. And you had a, an art exhibit at the Block Museum of her work. And uh, she's, she is a product of the, the Chicago area. But uh, she, she really was the one who did these fantastic drawings of, um, of Wright's work. So um, I'm going to close uh, and just a reminder that Wright uh, defined his architecture as organic buildings that grow and harmonize with their surroundings and uh, show you this picture of falling water, which of course came much later in 1935, but just to sort of entice you to uh, look ahead because there is lots more of um, of Rice work to take a look at. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Joan. Okay, so thank you, Donna. Uh, I hope everybody can see the picture. Is there any, any problem with that? We good, Paula? Hello. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Good to go. I, okay, we're good to go. All right. So uh, my presentation picks up a number of years after Donna ends, and we're going to talk about uh, the Japanese architects who have worked in Chicago over the last fifty years and changed our skyline. And we're going to start with oh, the first architect I'm going to talk about is Minoru Yamasaki. And uh, there are about four or five architects and artists who have really affected our skyline in the last 50 years. And he was really uh, one of the first. We say he's a Japanese architect, but he was born in Seattle, Washington. So technically an American of Japanese extraction. He was educated in Washington, went to architecture school and soon thereafter moved to New York City. I think probably for two reasons. One, 
there was not a lot of going on in terms of architecture and design in Seattle in the 1930s and New York was much more the center of that. And second of all, it allowed him to avoid the anti-Japanese sentiment that was growing on the West Coast and he was never incarcerated in an American concentration camp as many of his fellow uh, colleagues, and Japan, uh, colleagues and friends of Japanese descent were. He was a very prolific designer and in 1949, he moved to Detroit and established his own firm and designed all over the world. Perhaps he is most famous for these buildings, the World Trade Center towers, which were destroyed in 9-11. But you can see very modern rectangular buildings, very strong, uh, uh, facades of uh, steel, concrete, and glass. And these were completed in 1973, but the design of these really started uh, probably a decade earlier in the 1960s. About the same time this was completed in New York, however, this building was designed and went up in Chicago, the Montgomery Ward Company headquarters, located uh, near 900 uh, Chicago. It, you can see in behind it, is the Montgomery Ward catalog house on the river. And this was the corporate headquarters for about 27 years. And of course the land then was not very expensive. It was surrounded by surface parking lots. The building features four large white travertine marble corners. And then looking north and south, there were spandrels. Those are the horizontal elements between the windows of dark black aluminum with dark windows. And then very narrow bands of windows looking east and west. Of course, in the 1970s, we really didn't think that the river was particularly valuable to look out at. So the building was sited with very little view of the river, but really looking into the city and then all on the north side. Montgomery Ward uh, Company went bankrupt in 1999. And a few years later, it was repurposed or adaptively reused and opened up as a condominium building called the Montgomery. You can see that the travertine marble corners have been cleaned and then the black aluminum spandrels have been replaced with white ones. The dark black tinted windows have been replaced with lighter ones. And then on the east and west, you see those narrow windows became balconies because this is now a living space. The elevators, the stairwells, the plumbing, the mechanicals are still in those corners, uh, which really suits the condominium owners, I think quite well. And they, if you happen to have a condominium that has a view, to the west, you get to see the Chicago River, which of course now people all want to see as well. Now, Yamasaki also designed another building in Chicago. Some of you may be very familiar with this one because it is near Evanston, the North Shore Congregation Israel Synagogue that went up in 1964. Again, about the same time, he was probably beginning the design for the World Trade Centers in New York. This is very near the lake. You could see it in the background on a large wooded open lot. It features eight pairs of fan vaults made out of reinforced and precast concrete. It's 55 feet tall, about 16 meters. And you can see in those fan vaults, there are ribbons of windows. And then of course, down at ground level, you also see some windows and doors. And that's somewhat unusual, by the way, in synagogue architecture to have the, those windows at ground level. But this design by Yamasaki features a tremendous amount of light. Here's a picture of the sanctuary which Yamasaki called a confluence of daylight and solids. Here's another picture of that beautiful sanctuary. And on the right, you see those windows and that arch is called an OG arch. It's formed by combining a convex and concave shape. And it actually dates from about the 15th century. You'll see arches that look like that on the Doge's palace in Venice. But not only was it, uh, you know, <laughs> Yamasaki borrowed from the Venetians, he clearly liked this OG art shape quite a bit. If you look at the World Trade Center base uh, before it was destroyed, you can see these OG arches formed by the concrete um, forms that stretch uh, vertically up the, or stretch vertically up the facade of that building. Now the North Shore Congregation Israel has a soaring concrete roof. These end walls weigh 150 tons and they were poured in place to support and create the sweeping roof line. And they feature both at both ends of the building, you will find these soaring concrete roofs. Now I um, surmise that Yamasaki had, who had traveled to Japan must have visited with probably the greatest architect of the second half of the 20th century in Japan, a man named Kenzo Tange. He did design one building in Chicago, which I'll show in a minute. 
But Tange was really known for this building in Tokyo, the Yoyogi Gym that was designed and built for the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. At the time, this was the largest suspended roof span and it features a soaring steel roof in contrast to the North Shore Congregation Israel, which is a concrete roof. And just a word about Tange and this structure. This was 19 years after the end of World War II. Japan was flattened by the Jimmy Doolittle bombing raids. It was left in ashes. The uh, buildings before the war were largely wood and they were highly combustible. Japan was, you know, as I said, was destitute. And then 19 years later, they hosted the Tokyo Olympics and the pride that the Japanese had for that achievement, I, I cannot overestimate that. And so this became a symbol really of Japan's rebirth after the war and, and how hard people worked to create a new, a new country and especially in Tokyo, how it was rebuilt from the ashes. And so Tange got a tremendous amount of acclaim for this roof, but I'm just gonna go back. You see this roof, you see the North Shore Congregation in Israel. I think there's a, a clear line between the two architects. Here's some information on Tange himself. He died about 16 years ago. He designed buildings on five continents, won the Pritzker Prize, which is the most prestigious prize given to architects. But there's only one building in Chicago and that stands at State and Grand, 515 North State Street. It's a, um, a, about a 30 story building um, encased in glass with a 50 foot wedge between floors 24 and 28. Unfortunately, when you walk along the street, you don't really see that cutout wedge, which I think is, is fairly striking at that intersection. Now, Tange also influenced other architects Namely, the next architect we're going to talk about, Tadao Ando, who still lives. And Ando will, has admitted and said that he was influenced by three major architects. Tange was one of them. Frank Lloyd Wright was the second. And Le Corbusier, the French Swiss architect, was the third. Ando's kind of got an interesting background. He was self-taught. He didn't go to architecture school. Uh, he didn't grow up very wealthy. In fact, to support himself, he was a prize fighter at one point. But as a teenager, he saw Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, and that's what made him decide to become an architect. And he has a number of buildings and designs here in Chicago that we get to enjoy. The first is an interior space at the Art Institute of Chicago called the Ando Screen Gallery from 1990. and of wall space for exhibiting Japanese screens and prints. As I said also, um, he was influenced also by Le Corbusier and Le Corbusier worked earlier in the 20th century, one of the great modern architects. This is perhaps one of his most famous buildings, Villa Savoy outside of Paris. And this one up in 1927, you'll notice the very smooth concrete and the ribbon of windows giving a great deal of uh, an idea of light and space, but also privacy too, because there's a very ambiguous entrance. You really can't tell where the entrance is, a la some of the buildings that Donna previously showed that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. And uh, this is actually my own photograph. And I will tell you that I walked around this building to find the entrance to go in to tour it. And it, it's just not immediately obvious, but Anda was, was very influenced by Laura Courbusier. And uh, he had a show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and uh, a Chicagoan named Fred Eichainer saw that show in 1991 and commissioned Ando to design his house in Lincoln Park. And here it is at 665 Wrightwood Avenue, uh, went up about 20 years ago. It's called the Eichainer Lee Residence. Again, you see this very, very smooth concrete. You see these very clear windows giving a very uh, clear image of light and space within the building. But talk about privacy. You look at that front door, you can't see where the doorknob is. You can't see how that door opens. You can stand outside that fence. <laughs> I promise you, you cannot tell how to get inside that building, not at all. Here is a view of the back of the building, which shows a little bit of the design. So you can kind of see there's a lot more, a lot more windows in the back and there's this cube on the left and then this kind of walkway in. And then to the right, we can just see the smooth concrete wall of sort of another cube. So it's two cubes 
joined by a walkway. And as I said, that Ando, this was um, 2001, but 25 years earlier, he had designed a building in Osaka called the Azuma House. And here is a rendering of that architectural drawing that shows again, those two cubes connected by a walkway. So it's a design that Ando had used before. And this walkway is sort of a transition, but it's also an integral part of the house. And Ando said, in its simple but rich spatial composition, in its expression of enclosure, and in the way light gives character to daily life spaces, this house encapsulates an image of my architecture. And here you again see it on the right as well. Now, Eichener liked his house so much that he bought the house next to him, which is that red brick structure, and commissioned Ando to turn it into an art gallery, which is known as Wrightwood 659. But Eichener told Ando he did not want to destroy the residential nature of the neighborhood. So he didn't want another very modern building. He wanted Ando to maintain the facade of Wrightwood 659, which used to be a 30 unit apartment building. And so Ando has maintained the facade. It's a, we call it a neo-federalist style with those triangular roof line elements over the door. And then at the top of the building, the concrete medallions that you also see, uh, and then the limestone. I will say they tuck pointed the brick to make it look very bright. And then they replace some of this limestone. This is not the original limestone. It's not the original windows um, necessarily. And then they added, if you look on the left, you can see 659 in very bright letters. That's obviously a modern addition as well. But they wanted to keep the neighborhood feel intact. And you can see at the very top, and I'll talk more about this later, that the top floor was added as well, a much more modern top floor. Now, if we go inside 659 Wrightwood, you can see it's been completely opened up to make a gallery and that stairwell is really an integral part of the design as well. Most of the structural columns from those 30 apartment buildings were removed and the load bearing structures are taken out of the central spaces. And you really can concentrate on this interplay of solid and void. Here's another view from at the top of the original four stories, the penthouse is on top of this. And you'll notice all the bricks, they repurposed 20,000 bricks from the inside of this building. And here's another view of the inside. And I just like to point out two features there. One is notice how deep the window wells are. And that's because when they designed the building and they took out all the load bearing structures from inside, they had to find another way to hold the building up. So Ando added uh, reinforced concrete walls between the exterior red brick and this interior tan brick. So it's basically a sandwich of brick uh, of, um, on both sides of this reinforced concrete structures. And also if you'll notice that the mortar doesn't come up to the edge of the brick, that's called raked brick. And it, uh, it's not smooth. It leads to a great deal of texture and shadow play when the light moves across the facade of the window. And this was very, very deliberate. And interestingly enough, although <laughs> this building is very recent, it's not something new, this raked brick. Frank Lloyd Wright did it about a hundred years earlier at the Darwin Martin House. And you can see the raked brick above the sofa, particularly on the left. And Frank Lloyd Wright did it for the very same reason. It adds texture and it adds uh, visual interest and provides shadow and light inside the building. And now we're going back to take a look at that top floor of Wrightwood 659 that was uh, additional design ad by Ando. And it gives a very, uh, this glassed in wall. You can see it's there's more exhibit space that's provided, but also it allows people to look out on the tree canopy of Lincoln Park and connect to nature, which of course was very much a Frank Lloyd Wright feature that he liked to have in his designs as well. And it's got a little bit of a bonus here you get to look down on 665 Wrightwood, the Eichener house and see its construction and its gardens. You can see again, the two cubes connected by that walkway and how integral that walkway is to design of that house, which when you look from the outside, you have no idea of what lies behind it, but here you can see it. Our last uh, artist of Jap uh, Japanese artist who's worked in Chicago, not really an architect, but an artist of renown, Yoko Ono. 
I have to say that I, <laughs> when I saw she was born in 1933, I thought, oh my goodness, she's almost 90 years old. She's only seven years younger than Queen Elizabeth. So it was a little bit of a shock to see, because um, I, of course, remember Yoko Ono from some other epoch eh, eh, years in my life. But she has uh, created two sculptures at, in Chicago. One is at the Art Institute. And the second one called Sky Landing is down on the south side of Chicago, near the Japanese gardens behind the Museum of Science and Industry. It consists of 12 petals sticking out of the earth, 12 lotus petals, 12 feet tall or four meters. And she said she wanted this in Chicago because the last song John Lennon was working on before he was killed uh, had to do with Chicago. So she felt the tie to Chicago and to have it here was important to her. It's very interactive and you know, popular on the south side. You could see children playing hide and seek here among the petals. And it's located on Wooded Island where 123 years earlier, Frank Lloyd Wright stood developing ties between Chicago and Japan. So over that whole period, we've had a very close relationship with Japanese design, Japanese architects, and we have appreciated their contributions to our skyline and to our cityscape as well. We, I got a number of pictures from different places and we welcome your questions. Thank you both so much. This was just fascinating and, um, and beautiful and all things that we love about Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. Um, so yes, if you have any questions, if you could put them in the chat function and that Joan and Donna can address them. Okay, any questions? Thank you, it's nice, yeah. <laughs> And great presentation, thank you. How, I just have a quick question. How do you, um, as part of the uh, CAC, how do you all decide on like which lectures? And I mean, it just, there's, I mean, there's so much information, right? I mean, you could probably spend, you know, millions of years trying trying to go through all this. Do you sort of just pick things that you, you know the most about or that you're most interested in or? Well, there, there's, 400, there's 400 docents, 400 volunteer docents. Oh my gosh, 400? Oh my gosh, okay. And, well, and go. people are just excited about Chicago and design and architecture. And so the tours, and we have almost 100 tours, and we pretty much offer about 80 at a time. The tours are all generated by docents and developed by docents and um, we train each other. So it's, it's very self-generating. Well, this... Um, oh, I, I see a question though. Do we uh, have a photo well, of Yoko's I was, artist? I was just going to add that this one came up because um, a, a Japanese heritage group wanted a program. And so, I don't know, someone, someone decided, well, you know, Japanese influence, Frank Lloyd Wright, and anyway, reached out and the two of us uh, picked yeah. up on it. The, the other thing I did want to mention before we go on, because um, uh, Joan was showing you Wrightwood 659, they have an extremely interesting exhibit right now. Oh, nice. Um, of um, Louis Sullivan and Wright, they have two sort of virtual reconstructions of Sullivan and Wright's work. So it's... Um, it's well worth well worth a visit there. That's good to know. Yeah, that's an incredible space. I've seen some art exhibitions there, uh, just a variety, and um, it's really. And now I know all about it, which I didn't know before. So, <laughs> thank you. It's a beautiful building. Yeah, and um, and then do you also? Um, oh, here's one. Was Yamashita influenced by Oscar Niemeyer at all? I don't know the answer to that. Nothing and nothing that I read said that, but I don't know. I, I think architects, there's a tremendous amount of interconnectedness and I don't know the answer. Um, 
Okay. And then in terms of, um, I was thinking about Frank Lloyd Wright's works that are scattered throughout the whole country. Um, does the foundation, I'm um, sorry, the center, do you do any like larger trips like, um, uh, you know, bus trips or something to go, you know, all around to see it all around throughout the country or are they more, is that through that Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation or how, how does that work? If people are interested. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't, I can't think of any um, ones at the centers in recent, I mean, at one of our, one of our usual tours in, in normal time um, is Frank Lloyd Wright by bus, but that just takes people out to Oak Park, but you get the full experience of the home and studio, the walk and Unity Temple. Um, I, I, do, I don't recall, I mean, you find- I know there are tour groups that do that, but I don't believe the CAC does it. CAC does it. Yeah, the Frank Lloyd Wright Trust or um, the Conservancy might, there's, there's so many different ones that do Frank Lloyd Wright. Right, you're right, you're absolutely right. I was thinking about it. I saw when you saw, when you were showing Falling River, I was like, oh, you know, yeah. Um, and also you can just contact the places themselves. So, um, you know, which makes it exciting too. Um, Okay, any other questions? All right, oh, here we go. Oh, here, there's, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the exhibit. Um, thank you. In the chat is where that exhibit that um, Donna had just mentioned. Um, great, well, thank you both so much. I can't tell you personally and also just from an art, center standpoint too, that this was just an amazing, amazing lecture and um, really, really just so, um, just the brain's ticking away and all these wonderful images and just the, the wealth of design and structure that we have in our world today. So thank you both so much. Our pleasure. And thanks all of you for coming. And um, our next uh, exhibition, I mean, our next in focus will be in January with Courtney Litterer, um, who's a fascinating woman in, in Chicago and she's got a design and sculpture firm and she's uh, doing public, um, managing public sculpture in Chicago. And so please join us for that. And uh, we'll see you all later. Have a wonderful holiday, but thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks.